Today we're going to check out a mechanical keyboard that's grabbed quite a lot of attention because of its design, but also because of their prominent marketing, and because of these things amongst others, it hasn't been received very well. But let's just give this a proper look and see how it fares, and make sure people know what they're getting into when backing Low Freeze Indiegogo campaign which is going on, which has already been easily funded. And this is the Low Free Dot. Opening up the box we have some paperwork, a right angle micro USB cable, and it did come in a little box but I lost that, and the keyboard itself. And here's the keyboard and it surely has a unique look. Amongst the enthusiast community, it hasn't had the best reception for its aesthetics. Whether it's their dislike for the company and their marketing, or their taste, it differs between people. I happen to quite like the look of the keyboard, and I know for sure that the average consumer will like it. The whole thing is that they're catering for people who do professional work and writing, and mention how 95% of mechanical keyboards are made for gaming. I mean it's certainly a high percentage in terms of keyboards being used, with Corsair and Razer really dominating the market, but definitely not in terms of models of keyboards. That being said, to go with their typist thinking, they've of course gone for a typewriter aesthetic. Again, I personally like this retro look. It features a very full and curvy design, much like many typewriters, like my grandfather's typewriter that I have here. The corners are rounded, along with the rounded edges. This then extends to the keycaps, which are round spherical keycaps. Everything just has the edge taken off to give it a very retro feel, but at the same time it's very clean and minimalist, despite using more complicated lines than what's used in today's keyboard designs. The keys are kind of inset into the keyboard, making a kind of wall around the keys, and at the top there's a larger and taller header. I think it helps break it up a bit and contrast the curves nicely. This is available in various colours, unfortunately I was given the most plain one. Not that I don't like plain black keyboards, but it's nice to just have something different, and something that doesn't pick up dust so easily. However, we do feature a red backspace keycap. The entire outer shell is made from plastic, and is a pretty smooth satin finish. Fingerprints do show because of its smoothness, but it's not that bad. However, because of the black background and the circle keycaps, the base is very visible and the dust is very easy to see, as said before. The build is actually quite nice with this. The plastic doesn't feel particularly cheap, but the main surprise is just how heavy this is, at about 800 grams, which compared to other keyboards is really quite respectable. The typeface on the keycaps is on point, just nice and clean, and they have lowercase lettering for the modifier keys. The keycaps used are thin 1.2mm ABS keycaps, and these are not double shot, so they're just black coated, laser etched, and these aren't the best. They're smooth and a bit shiny, and are very susceptible to key shine in the future, and they do show oils. And these keycaps are a bit different, in that the stem extends past the base of the keycap, and this is because of the plastic plate being more higher than usual, since the switches aren't actually mounted onto that top plate. And because of this, you can't have any other keycaps on here, even though it would be hard to replace these keycaps anyway. R1 and R2 OEM profile keycaps only just clip onto the top of the key switch stem, so they don't work. Even the low profile DSA keycaps don't work. However, these low free keycaps do work absolutely fine on other keyboards. On the right side we have our micro USB port, it doesn't really make sense to put it on the right side because most of us use our mouse there, but they did include the right angled cable so I guess it's fine. We then have our power switch, we have on, off and bluetooth, so if we want to use it plugged in we just switch it to on, but if we want to use it in wireless mode then we would switch it to bluetooth. And on the other switch is the option to choose between operating systems with Windows slash Android, or Apple. And that's one of the other good features, it's not neglecting the Apple side of things which many companies kind of do. So on top we actually have the command key symbol, and then the option keys on the front side, but we also have the windows and menu symbols still there. The function row shows the same keys as on an Apple keyboard, and it's this attention to the Apple side which I don't mind at all, and it is an advantage for Apple users, so this would make a nice keyboard for like an iPad. I actually end up using my tablet quite a lot, and it's just really nice to be able to connect it via Bluetooth. It can store up to 3 devices, which are designated to the 1, 2 and 3 keys, and the pairing process is really simple using the function key. 
The battery life is stated as so, however I haven't been able to test the longevity as I did use it plugged in and wireless messing with the times, however I never did run it flat. After 5 minutes of inactivity it does go into its sleep mode helping with that battery life. The keyboard is quite compact at 29.5cm wide, 14cm tall and about 4cm high at its highest point. We would refer to this as a 75% keyboard which is relative to a standard 100% full size keyboard although it would be more like a 70% I guess. It is missing most of the nav cluster in which normal 75% keyboards have some of making this keyboard a bit shorter. And it's essentially the same length as a 60% keyboard but with somewhat thick bezels. This gives us more space for other things like our mouse, giving us a more natural ergonomic position, bringing our hands closer together. Now pretty much the biggest complaint with this keyboard from reviews I've seen is that it's difficult to type on. And yeah, it is a bit troublesome. Many were saying that it's the circular keycaps, which is true to an extent since they are part of the cause, but in my experience it's the alignment of the keys or the stagger. A standard keyboard will use a normal stagger where the alignment differs between each row. This however has a uniform stagger, so if we look at a diagonal column they line up perfectly and this of course messes up with the spacing between keys. I am a touch typist so I don't need to look at the keys when typing, so keep that in mind. And I think this kind of put me at a disadvantage. For casual typing I got used to it within minutes and had no real issues with it. The number row was kind of difficult to get used to and I still do make mistakes when trying to put in a number like when typing a password. There are other quirks with this keyboard though, the glaring one is the directional arrow keys being misaligned. Personally it's not a huge deal for me but will definitely be a huge problem for those who often use them. What did happen many times though is that when I try to hit the shift key that's right next to it, which is now just a one unit key, I accidentally hit the up arrow key. Another issue I had was the backspace key. It's further and smaller than usual. If we compare it to a standard ANSI keyboard, the distance from the P key is about 1.5 centimeters further, measuring it like this. And since it is smaller, it takes that little bit more effort to hit it. The enter and left shift key are the only keys that aren't one unit keys besides the spacebar. What's very interesting is that they've gone with two switches rather than a stabilized key. Not sure why they did this and it seemed like the easy option so they didn't need to change the shape of the keycap, but by not having stabilizers the actuation force required essentially doubles, so these are some pretty heavy keys especially since we tend to use our weakest fingers on them. But on top of that, if we press it on one side it will of course actuate the first switch first and then the other, and at the same time it makes it more difficult and heavier to press making it really sluggish. The best place to press it is in the center, in which there's not even a finger groove for. The positioning of the FN key also messes up with me pressing the left control key. It will definitely get some time to get used to and that's absolutely fine. I've tried many different layouts that need time to get used to, but the thing is is that there's no real advantage to this layout. It's not like an ortho linear layout which aims to reduce finger movement and it's not like an ergonomic keyboard and like a 40% keyboard because those have reasons behind it, however this is clearly an example of form over function. So since it is supposed to be a typist keyboard, in my opinion there's quite a few quirks that don't really go with that philosophy. However it doesn't excel in much else, like for gaming, the layout is a bit weird like with the arrow keys plus it only has two key rollover, meaning that it's guaranteed registering at least two keys, however that's absolutely fine for normal use. And that brings us to the key switches. This is only available in Getter on Blues, again not offering flexibility, but they have chosen a solid switch. They've gone for a clicky switch to mimic the loud typewriter noise, and it is nice of them to go with Gatoron Blues even though I don't really mind Outamu Blues as well, so these are tactile and clicky. And here's a quick sound test. The spacebar was a surprising delight for me, it had this light clicky feel and sound to it, which sounded quite crisp. Unfortunately I wasn't able to take it apart without destroying it, 
I took out all the screws but with no success, but since it is quite heavy, it probably has a steel plate in there. At the end of the day, it's not a keyboard targeted at mechanical keyboard enthusiasts because it absolutely does trigger a lot of views that we hold, and that's absolutely fine since it's just not meant for us. And frankly, there's not too many in this category where it's targeting a more average consumer. The build of the keyboard is quite reasonable and it's packing some good weight. Despite only offering one key switch, they have made a solid choice in Gator on Blues, and it does go with their whole typewriter thing. The Bluetooth experience is simple and easy to use, and works perfectly with the battery life stated to be quite good. However, the issue is the typing experience, and that's the primary function of a keyboard. It's just not that great, however, if you're willing to give it time, then of course you'll get used to it. But it's that notion towards aesthetics over function that will turn many away, but it's evidently not a problem to people with other products. But the attention to looks and its accommodation for Apple products is its greatest strong point, especially with its other colours. So all up, it's not enthusiast grade, it's not gamer grade, but it's for that casual consumer that likes to look at nice things and have a solid keyboard.